the Lord will open your eyes of understanding and that the word of God will enrich your life and bless your soul today. Open your mouth and pray to the Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Bible study. We thank you for bringing us together. We're asking, Lord, that the Bible study will be a blessing to everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray, Lord, you'll keep us awake. Help us, Lord, to have deep understanding of your word. Amen. And your word will uh, impact our Christian experiences our personal lives and vocation everywhere in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with us as we study, Lord. Amen. Let your spirit be with everyone Amen. to guide us into all truth. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tonight we're looking at John chapter 13. In John chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 31. It says, Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while, I, am I with you? Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, A new commandment I give unto you, That ye love one another, As I have loved you, That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not come, cannot follow now, but thou shalt follow me here afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for, the, for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Those are the eight verses we are looking at tonight. As we come back to verse 1, it says, therefore, when he was gone out, that means when Judas Iscariot was gone out of the midst 
of the children of God, of the disciples of Christ. And he came out of that assembly. Jesus now said, now, at this very time, even as Judas has gone out, he says, the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. From that verse, we are taking our topic tonight, the glory of God and the glorification of Christ. The glory of God and the glorification of Christ. But the circumstances are surprising. That Christ should say at this very time, this is the time that the Son of Man is glorified. And this is the time that God himself is glorified. Look at the first part of verse 31. Therefore, when he, Judas Iscariot, was gone out. Stop there for a moment. All that follows after this now from the rest of chapter 13, 14, 15 and the rest are taken or given or they took place without the presence of Judas Iscariot. He was gone out. What will that mean? Number one, he went out into spiritual darkness never to return to the gospel light. He had been called. He had been converted. He had been commissioned. He went out when those disciples went out to abide you. Obviously, he had repented. He couldn't have gone to preach repentance if he himself had not repented. But now, he had backslidden, saved, eventually lost, converted, but he compromised his faith. And the Bible says now, he went out, going out into spiritual darkness, Never to return to the gospel light. Number two, he went out with Satan, never to be recovered from the snare of the devil. He went out with Satan. How about that? Look at verse 27. It says, and after the sob, Satan entered into him. Satan entered into him. Filled with Satan, controlled by Satan, empowered by Satan. Directed by Satan, he went out with Satan and he couldn't recover himself again from uh, the snare of the devil. I'm reading to you from 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, you see that expression, and this now became applicable to Judas Iscariot. In verse 26, it says that they might recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Judas Iscariot had been taken captive by the devil. His heart, his mind, his life, his destiny seized by the devil and could never recover himself. And he went out. He went out with Satan, never to be recovered. Number three, he went out from the congregation of the righteous. The righteous people were there. The disciples were there. They were all with the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he saw that. Saw that congregation of the righteous. And he went out. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 21. Romans chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 16. It says, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. That's what happened to Judas Iscariot. The congregation of the righteous and the congregation of understanding, the congregation of the people of God were there. He was in their midst. He could have pleaded. He could have been restored. But no, he wandered away to the congregation of the dead, never to return again. He went out. He went out after the last warning. He went out after the last warning. You never know what the what last warning will come to you. You're in the Lord and you have been born again and then you're kind of getting into some evil. And the Lord is warning and warning and warning like he warned Judas Iscariot. But he went out of the last warning never to hear the voice of the pleading shepherd. Come back to chapter 13 of John. In John chapter 13, I'm reading here from verse 21. It says, when Jesus had not said, 
he was troubled in spirit and he testified and said verily verily i say unto you that one of you shall betray me and then he began to ask is it i is it i and judas is carried out at the effort trade the audacity and the boldness uh, to ask is it i in the other passages in uh, mark uh, matthew and luke and jesus said thou hast said and with that last warning now he went out and the voice of the shepherd they will never hear again have you thought about it that somebody may be in the lord he may be in the church and may be in the congregation of the righteous and then some temptations are coming that is not resisting some trials are coming that is not uh, pushing away and some things it may be because of his covetousness because of money and eventually it goes out and you never can tell when a man goes out when a woman goes out for the last time uh, and the warning of the voice of the shepherd never comes to him again number five he went out to do quickly what satan had put in his heart to do he went out quickly to do what satan had put in his heart to do look at that chapter 13 verse 2 in chapter 13 verse 2 it says and supper being ended the devil having now put into seat into the heart of judas Iscariot, simon's son to betray him this was all the plot of the devil the plan of the devil and satan approached in his heart and jesus told him in verse 27 verse 27 and after the sob satan entered into him then said jesus unto him that thou that thou doest do quickly and it was in a hurry now to perish, in a hurry to be damned, in a hurry to go into perdition. For he went out to do quickly what Satan had put in his heart to do. He went out far beyond the outstretched hand of grace and mercy. The Lord had been stretching forth the hand of grace and mercy unto Judas' carriage. But no, he would not respond. And for the last time, that opportunity came, but he lost the opportunity. I pray you'll not lose your opportunity. Yeah. And you can never tell when that last pleading will come, when that last warning will come. And we're told in Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10, verse 21, but to Israel he says, all day long I have stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. That happened to Judas Iscariot. Number seven, he went out beyond the point of no return. The warning, the last warning I've been given. The love, the last bit of love had been shown. The mercy. And the last offer of mercy had been given. And now Judas is carried out. Looking at all that, went away and he went out beyond the point of no return. He went into damnation. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, reading from verse 24. That man went out and is still out of the kingdom. He's still out of the territory of the domain of mercy i pray that will not happen to you yeah. but must heed the warning matthew chapter 26 verse 24 matthew chapter 26 verse 24 the son of man goes as it is written of him but woe unto that man judas iscariot and every backslider that makes himself herself irredeemable Warned to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, he said, I, and he said unto him, Everybody tell me, Thou hast said, and even with that, he will not return. The devil blindfolded him. The devil made him deaf and dead and blind to warn him. That's why we have Matthew chapter 23 verse 33. Matthew 23 verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape 
the damnation of hell. Judas Iscariot was all the warnings being given of the love of Christ's mission to you. And yet you appear irredeemable. How will you escape the damnation of hell? After the deed was done. Look at this in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. I'm reading from verse 5. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went. And what did he do? He hanged himself. He hanged himself. And that shows he went eventually to perdition and to damnation. It says in John chapter 13. John chapter 13 telling us now what actually happened. Verse 31. And there it says in verse 31. Therefore when he had gone out. Jesus said, now, after Judas is gone, now, with only believers remaining, now, with only the people that want to listen to the voice of the shepherd remaining, now, is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Looking at that verse, sometimes it comes uh, like a surprise. Judas Scott actually went to the chief priest. He went to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And the crucifixion was very near now. The betrayal was very near now. And Jesus said, now that the betrayal is near, now is the Son of Man glorified. And now is God himself glorified. What did he mean by that? He said, crucifixion would be in glory. Because it's going to mean my sacrifice for the whole world. And this is the fulfillment of behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. Although this man is going to do something negative and is going to betray the Son of Man. And yet it will bring the salvation of the people of the world. That's why we have the fulfillment of what we read about in Psalm 76. Psalm 76, I'm reading from verse 10. Psalm 76, verse 10. Surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. Surely this betrayal will bring glory to you. Surely this action of Judas is carried out. Although that was not his intention, he did what he did because of his covetousness. But even then, this betrayal leading to the crucifixion, leading to the burial, and leading to the resurrection of Christ, and leading to the salvation of multitudes, will bring glory unto you surely. The wrath of man shall praise thee. As I told you tonight, we're looking at the glory of God and the glorification of Christ. The glory of God and the glorification of Christ. Three points we're looking at. Number one, the glory in the city Savior's crucifixion. The glory in the Savior's crucifixion from his own statement himself. Number two, the greatness of our sanctifier's commandment. He gave us a commandment, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, is the greatness of that commandment of our sanctifier. When he sanctifies us, when he takes out the Adamic nature, when he approves that root of sin and when he cleanses us from the original sin then is it possible for us to love the lord our god with all our heart with all our soul and with all our mind and then to love one another as he himself has loved us the greatness of our sanctifier's commandment number three the godlessness of self-confidence the godlessness of self-confidence. We know Peter, the way he always talks, and it eventually results in bragging. It's like, others may not, but I can do this one. Others may not want to die with you, but I'm telling you, Master, I will die with you. And when Jesus warned him and said, that's empty boast, that's self-confidence, and it will not take root. Say, no, you can count on me. I'm going to do it. And then we'll see what followed after the godlessness of self-confidence. We're coming back to number one. Please tell me number one there. 
the glory in the Savior's crucifixion. We're coming to John chapter 13, verse 31. John chapter 13, verse 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. And then he says in verse 32, If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. He said that the glory is not something far away as I go to the cross and as I experience the weight and the load of the sins of the whole world and then I'm able to redeem humanity from their sin. This glory is coming immediately. And now he told them in verse 33, he says, little children referring to his disciples, Yet a little while am I with you. A little while I'll still talk to you. A little while I'm going to reveal some things to you in chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 17. Before the betrayer will come in chapter 18. Now at this time a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews whither I go. Ye cannot come. He told them he was going to the father. Because he said let not your heart be troubled. Troubled. Let your judge believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions. And he says, If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He said, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to the heavenly father. I'm going to that place. You cannot come now. You won't even come now. I still have some work for you to do in the acts of the apostles. When you are finished, you will come later. And so we read in that verse 33. So now I say unto you, as I said unto the Jews, the point is, how did this crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, how did it bring glory unto the Father and glory unto him? To start with, let's, uh, come, let's come to the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 53. So we know what he's talking about when he said, now the Son of Man is glorified and now the Father is also glorified. We're looking at, at, at Isaiah chapter 53 and I'm reading here from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 53. Look at verse 10. It says, yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. He's talking about his crucifixion. And when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Crucifixion. He says, he shall see a siege. And he shall prolong his days. He's talking about his resurrection there. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The pleasure of the Lord to save the sinner. The pleasure of the world to save the nation. The pleasure of the world to save the whole world shall prosper. It is said, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Many are going to be forgiven. Many are going to be saved. Many are going to be justified. And in that is the glory of Christ. And it says, for he shall be bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he has poured out his soul unto death. You see that crucifixion and it was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And that's what it's referring to. It says when those souls are saved, that's glory when those souls are brought back from the wilderness of sin and they're brought into fellowship with the heavenly father that is the glory we we'll come to the new testament in john chapter 12 john chapter 12 reading from verse 23 john chapter 12 verse 23 it tells us in verse 23 john chapter 12 it says over here and jesus answered them saying the hour is come that the son of man shall be glorified the hour is come this is the time i've been waiting for this is the purpose i came to the world he didn't just look at it 
as suffering. He saw it as salvation for the world. He did look at it as just crucifixion. He saw it as a conversion of the world. He didn't look at it as pain. He saw it as the pleasure of the Lord being fulfilled. And he saw that when this crucifixion has taken place, many will come into the kingdom of God. He said, that is glory. The hour is come that the Son of Man shall be glorified. Look at what he said after verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. He says, except I'm crucified and then I'm buried and I fall into the ground and then I'm buried like that corn of wheat I'll abide alone with only these few people in the land of Israel who have come to me. But when I die, when I'm crucified, when I die, when I'm buried, and then I rise again, there will be conversion all throughout the world, and that brings glory to the Lord. Then he says, but if he die, he bringeth forth much fruit. And then he goes on to say in verse 28, look at verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it, and will glorify it again. And so Jesus Jesus looked at his crucifixion in a positive way, in a practical way, in a purposeful manner, looking at what that crucifixion will accomplish. You are coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, verse 13. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3, we're reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his son, Jesus. You see that? He died, was buried, and he rose again. And because of the result of that rising again, because of the result of that resurrection, the Father has glorified his son, Jesus, whom he delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him Go. Colossians chapter 2, the result of the cross. The Colossians chapter 2, the evident effect of the cross on humanity, on you and on me, which is the glory that Jesus Christ was talking about. Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 14, it says in verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and he took it out of the way nailing it to his cross that's a glory that's a glory that the writing against us the condemnation against us the perdition against us the punishment against us has now been erased and and blotted out in verse 15 and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a show of them openly tell me the rest of that verse triumphing over them in it that he is over them in the cross that's the glory that's the glory when you go through pain and eventually something good comes out of that pain when you go through some suffering and something wonderful that couldn't have happened came out of that suffering and that pain that's the glory and that's the joy in philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 Verse 8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient, look at this, unto death, even the death of the cross. When people look at that, they think of humiliation. No, he was thinking of honor. When people think of that, they think of uh, suffering and sacrifice. No, he was thinking of, of our salvation and of our sanctification. Look at the rest of the verse there of uh, that passage. Wherefore God has highly exalted him. Wherefore, because of that death, because of that humiliation, how he humbled himself. And because of the death on the cross of Calvary, wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. This is the glory now. This is the glory now. Look at this. In this uh, verse 10, uh, it tells us that at the name of Jesus, at the name of Jesus who died, who was buried, who rose again, every knee shall bow. Of things in heaven 
and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's why if you suffer in a redemptive way, that you see if your suffering brings redemption to other people, you're not thinking of I'm suffering, I'm suffering. You know that that suffering, you know that that hardship, you know that that pressure is bringing salvation, redemption, forgiveness, a title to heaven, a ticket to heaven, to the lives of other people. Therefore, you are not thinking of what you suffer. You are thinking of what he is doing. That's what Jesus Jesus was looking at, we're coming to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. It says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him. You see that? The joy that was set before him. It says, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so that's why Jesus said, this is glory. And the glory is coming because now I'm going to suffer. I'm going to make this sacrifice and it will be for the salvation of humanity. The hour of crucifixion was near, very near. Our Lord Jesus Christ eagerly looked forward and saw the glory that will follow. Saw the glory that will follow. First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. Not just the cross, there's a glory that will follow. Not just the crucifixion, uh, there's a glory that will follow. Not just the weeping at the weeping post, uh, there's a glory that will follow. Not just the jesting of the people, the journeying of the people, there's a glory that will follow. First Peter chapter 1, verse 11. Searching watch, or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify. Look at this when he testified beforehand look at this now the sufferings of christ testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow and the glory that should follow that's what the Lord was looking up to and that's what the Lord was looking forward to number one he saw our salvation through his suffering that's the glory. He saw our salvation. He saw your salvation. He saw my salvation. He saw our redemption through his suffering. Number two, he saw the conversion of the world through his crucifixion. It wasn't just the crucifixion. He saw the conversion. And because he saw that conversion, and he knew what that conversion will mean, will mean to him, will mean to the Father, will mean to heaven, and will mean to those who are converted, see that conversion through that crucifixion. He rejoiced and said, I see glory coming. Number three, he saw our blessing in his betrayal he saw our blessing in his betrayal and because of the benefits and the blessings that will follow the blessing of salvation the blessing of our healing the blessing of our deliverance and the blessing you know, of all the good things of heaven coming upon our lives he saw those blessings in his betrayal and he said this is glory there's no pain here, and there's uh, something that you cannot endure here. This is glory. Number four, he saw our holiness, and he saw our eternal happiness in his humiliation. And so he looked beyond the humiliation, and he said, it's the time of glory. It's the day of glory. It's the hour of glory. Because he saw our holiness through his humiliation. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And if my suffering, my humiliation, and the betrayal will bring holiness to these people and will bring eternal happiness to them. That is glory. Number five is our sanctification through his sacrifice. He saw our sanctification through his sacrifice. And so the sacrifice then was not painful as it would have been painful if there was not, no result after that. That's why he said, now shall the Son of Man be glorified. Now shall God himself be glorified because this sacrifice is for our sanctification. Number six, he saw our deliverance through his death. 
is so our deliverance through his death because uh, he came to destroy the one that has the power of death even the devil and the only way he could do that is that the devil will bruise him at his feet and then he will knock the head of the evil one and because he saw that deliverance through his death that's why he said this is glory this is glory because when i die for the sake of the people and they're delivered from the powers of satan and they're delivered from the punishment of hell that is glory indeed number seven he saw our paradise through his pain he saw our paradise through his pain that's why he said glory to god and glory to the son and with glory in his cross look at um, galatians chapter 6 reading from verse 14 galatians chapter 6 and I'm reading from verse 14. It says, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul the Apostle said, I glory in the cross. Why not for the cross? I wouldn't have been saved. Why not for the cross? My life will not have any purpose. And because of that, I glory in the cross of Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. And so that crucifixion brought glory. I pray to bring glory to your life. John chapter 13, we're coming to verses 34 and 35. Uh, John chapter 13, we're looking at verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, even as I love you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. He says, a new commandment I give unto you. And then he says that you love one another. And there may be people wondering, you know, isn't uh, that commandment in the Old Testament? You love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and you love your neighbor as yourself. If that commandment was in the Old Testament, how is it a new commandment I give unto you? What's new here? Look at this very closely. Verse 34, a new commandment I give unto you, that she love one another. Here here is what you underline as I have loved you as I have loved you the commandment had been there in the Old Testament but nobody could demonstrate that love like Jesus Christ demonstrated that love and Jesus said I came from heaven and I demonstrated the love of God and now I'm passing that unto you this is new it is new because the old man is going to be crushed it is new because the Adamic nature is going to be removed. It is new because everything that will set you back, everything that will pull you back, that you'll not be able to love like you ought to love, everything is going to be removed. It's going to be new because of Calvary. It's going to be new because of the original nature of sin that is going to be eradicated and taken away. And so now with a cleansed heart, with a purified heart, and so now with a purged heart, and so now with with a Christ-like mind, you can love one another as I have loved you. Look at the starting point, new commandment. I give unto you that she love one another as I, as I, Christ, has loved you. Look at chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 12. Chapter 15, verse 12. It says, this is my commandment. This peculiar, this coming from the Savior. This is my commandment. This peculiar, this coming from the sanctifier. This is coming from the King of Kings and the Lord of Loves. This is coming from a Redeemer who has demonstrated that love and he says this is my commandment that she love one another. Tell me the rest there. As I have loved you. That's the new thing there. Look at verse 13. Greater love as no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. This is new. This is new. That a man lay down his life for his friends. We're looking at 4 Thessalonians chapter 3. 4 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12 And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another. Amen. 
and towards all men, even us, even us, we do towards you to the end for the purpose, this is the goal, that you may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Amen. Chapter 4, look at verse 9. But as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you. For ye, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You are taught of God to love one another. And, and indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye tell me, that ye tell me out aloud increase more and more i pray that you'll not say i've done enough i said you'll not say i've done enough you'll do it more and more in jesus name let's come back to john chapter 13 john Chapter 13, reading from verse 34. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Now, as we're talking about this love, there are two sides to this love. We need to understand that. Two sides to this love. Number one, what this kind of love will never do to the brethren, to your brother, to your sister, to your husband, to your wife, to your child, to your parent, to a co-worker, to a co-pilgrim, a pilgrim like you, on the way to heaven. Number one, what this kind of love will never do the other side number two what this kind of love will always do the one side will never do the other side will always do and when you look at those two sides and you bring the two sides together that's the love he's talking about let's look at the first one what this kind of love will never do we're looking at romans chapter 14 Romans chapter 14, and I'm reading here from verse 13, what the love will not do. Romans chapter 14, verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, one another, one another. Let us not therefore judge one another. What is judgment of one another? There's no freedom. You want to do something, you say, I don't know what you'll think of this. I know my heart. I know my intention. I know I'm doing something good, but I can't misinterpret it. And where there is love, there'll be no judging of one another. But judge this rather, that no man put his stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes. Look at this. That she might learn in us not to think of men above that which is reaching, but that no one of you be puffed up one against another. There will be no pride. In the midst of the children of God, where there's love, you're not belittling your neighbor, you're not belittling your brother, you're not belittling your sister, and putting them down so that you can come up. There'll be no puffing up. Look at verse 7 For who make it thee to differ from another? Or, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now, if thou didst re receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou art? That's not receive it. There'll be no judging of one another. There'll be no puffing or being proud against one another. I'm better than him. No, you're always looking at areas where he might be better than you are. She might be better than you are. Galatians chapter 5, verse 26. Galatians 5, verse 26. It says, let us not be desirous of vain glory. 
provoking one another and be one another it says uh, where this kind of love is you'll not be provoking something somebody so that he can act foolishly you will not provoke somebody so that he can behave foolishly and then you say didn't i tell you it's a foolish man don't I, didn't i tell you it's a foolish woman you respected him you respected her you see her value now that she's nobody and he's nobody and you are the one that caused the provocation to make the man to make the woman became become like a fool it says what is love that will not be there it says where that is you, are, you don't have the love that christ is talking about the Adamic nature is operating the root of sin is operating the old man is operating there's lack of sanctification there because it says let us not be desirous of vain glory provoking one another envying one another we're looking at Gal Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 where this love of Christ is is telling us something things that will not be there in uh, colossians chapter 3 verse uh, 9 it says lie not one to another lie not one to another seeing that she have put off the old man with his deeds it says uh, where this uh, sanctification has taken place and where the lord has purified the heart and you live in that experience between husband and wife you are one flesh together the wife will not lie to the husband and the husband will not lie to the wife and the children will not lie to their parents and the parents will not lie to the children and the members will not lie to the minister to their pastor and the pastor will not lie to the members and the workers will not lie to one another there will be no lie coming out of your mouth coming out of your system because she loved when you lie to somebody you are deceiving that person you don't really respect that person you don't honor that person and you don't love that person where this love is lying not one to another seeing that she have put up the old man with his deeds james chapter 4 verse 11 where the love of christ reigns where the love of christ dwells it tells us what will never happen between us in james chapter 4 verse 11 it says speak not evil one of another brethren are we brethren it says then uh, don't see big evil of one another you know you are at the table maybe breakfast or lunch or supper and the discussion is about brother so and so it's about sister so and so and he's speaking evil of the absent person he says speak not evil one of another if you are saying what you cannot say in the presence of people or even what you could say in their presence but will hurt them you don't have the love that Christ is talking about speak not evil one of another we're looking at uh, chapter 5 verse 9 chapter 5 verse 9 uh, grudge one not one against another brethren grudge not one against the other you know when you do something negative to your brother something negative to your sister something negative to your husband something negative to your wife something negative to your pastor something negative to members of the church you don't have the love that christ is talking about he says grudge not if you are bearing grudge animosity bitterness in your heart and because you know you remember what he said you remember what he did and you remember because of that thing and now i'm going to take my own pound of flesh he has done his own and he hurt me i'm going to do my own now and i'm going to hurt him he will know that this is painful and i'm going to do this against him because of grudge it says you are not at the center of the will of god that's not what christ commanded christ said love one another as i have loved you grudge not one against another brethren lest she be condemned behold the judge standeth before the door we're coming to ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 the importance and the application of this love in a practical way in the midst of the children of god ephesians chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 25 it says wherefore 
putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. It says, if you are going to demonstrate that love of Christ, you are going to demonstrate that new commandment. You know what? You are going to speak the truth, act the truth, and demonstrate the truth every time. Then he goes on to say in verse 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Abusive language, insultive language, derogatory language, putting down other people that the person will feel less than human, less than who he is. He says, don't do that. If this love is there, this is what the love will never do. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers, and grip not the Holy Spirit, something that is not of love, grieves the holy spirit you know there are people that you see they can pray anytime and they'll do something that hurts their neighbor hurts their brother or hurts their wife or hurts their husband or hurts a dear fellow in the in the household of faith and then after that after that hurting after that a terrible thing then they'll go oh father oh father that's like those religious people that just pray they don't know what they're praying about it says that that when you do these negative things, it says it grieves the Holy Spirit whereby we're sealed unto the day of uh, redemption. Therefore, it says in verse 31, let how many forms of bitterness? All bitterness, all kinds of bitterness. There's the quiet bitterness, there's the loud bitterness. There's a talking kind of bitterness, and there's a quiet kind of bitterness. The bitterness is there, but you know, I will not talk because if I talk now, I've not even spoken, I'm getting this deal. So if I talk, I don't know what I'm going to have, but the bitterness is there. And he's saying every form of bitterness, all kinds of bitterness, and wrath, and anger, and clamor, and evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. You know what malice is? I said, you know what malice is? Uh-huh, you're acting as if you don't know. Do you know what malice is? Yes, when the husband will not greet the wife and the wife will not greet the husband, it may be for a, for an hour, it may be for a day, it may be for a and for some people, it's for a long time. You turn your face there, he turns his face over there, and, there, and it's because there's bitterness. It's the, because there's something unresolved, and Jesus is watching you, huh? Christian family, husband and wife, and the Christian workers and Christian leaders, and he says, love one another as I have loved you. If there is something to settle, settle it and let it go and then move on in the love of God. Look at verse 32. And be ye kind one to another. You will be kind. I said you will be kind. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another. Tell me the rest of that. Forgiving one another, even as Esau tried to forgive Jacob. And then after about 20 years, he said, Jacob is coming. Go tell him. I was the only one wanting to fight him before, but now I have 400 men with me. With me. And we're going to iron this out. That's not love. That's not love. It says, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I pray God will give us the grace. Did I hear amen from the church? There, there are two sides to so the love we're talking about. The one side is what love will never do to the other person. The other side is what love will always do. What love will always do. We're coming to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 50. Mark chapter 9 verse 50. Salt is good. But if the salt have lost his saltness, where we eat, will ye, will ye cease in it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Don't carry any kind of salt in your mind, any kind of salt on your shoulder, any kind of salt in your hand. Love one another and let there be peace.
peace between you and the other brother. We're looking at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm looking at verse 10. Romans chapter 12. And we're reading from verse 10. Be kindly affectioned one toward another with brotherly love. It says be kindly affectioned. That is even in your heart. The feeling of your heart. You know, you cannot be angry at somebody feeling good towards him. You cannot insult somebody feeling good towards him. You cannot hurt somebody feeling good towards him. It says you must have this love to be kindly affection or brotherly love in honor preferring one another. When we see the last time something honorable was to be given, it was to be given to one person, the three of you are there, and one steps back and says, let the others have. And then the other one steps back and says, let my brother have, let my sister to have or is it that we are competing with each other I want to shine and I want him to you know not shine and I want to move forward I want him to be ground, downgraded I want to be honored I want him to be humiliated I want him to get into a problem I want him not to know what he's doing so that he can behave foolishly in the midst of the people of God that's not the love Christ has commanded it says a new commandment I give unto you that she love one another, be kindly affection one to another, I, 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 with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. I pray it will happen through you. Yeah. Say it will happen through me. Yeah. But you know, but you know, I, I discovered that after the Bible study, we forget what we have learned. And when we get back home, we don't begin to practice it. And when you don't practice it, you will lose it. Anything you don't use, you are going to lose. But if you remember the Bible study, love will not do that. Love will not do that. Love will not do that. And love will always do this. Love will always do this. And you begin the practice. And the nature of Christ, and the love of Christ, and the image of Christ is inside you. And the old man is taken away, and the new man is established there. And you see, I'm going to put this to work. Our lives will be transformed. Look at, look at verse, look at verse 16. Be of the same mind, one toward another. That's the positive side of this love, of the same mind. I want to do well. I have the same mind towards him. I want him to do well. I want to be happy. I want the same thing for him. I want him to be happy. I want to make progress. I want the same thing for her. I want her to make progress. You have the same mind one to another that's the love the lord is talking about chapter 14 verse 19 of the romans romans chapter 19 chapter 14 verse 19 chapter 14 verse 19 let us therefore follow after the things that make for peace if i do that that will not bring peace if i say that to her that will not uh, bring peace. You know, there are some people that will say, I tell the truth. I tell the truth. I'm telling them uh, the way I feel. And he meets somebody here and he says, uh, has anybody told you the truth? Well, many people tell me the truth all the time, but I don't know what truth you are talking about. Have they told you the truth that you look ugly? You look terrible. That's the way I feel. And it is the truth. Well, that kind of truth will not bring peace. That kind of truth will not help the person. That kind of truth will not make the person excited to go out in life and go and achieve. You tell the truth that brings peace. And you do the things that bring peace in the household of faith to your brother, to your sister. Look at this. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, the things wherewith one may edify another. Edify another. Build up another, encourage another, and make somebody to want to do better than he did yesterday. That's the love we're talking about. Chapter 15, Romans chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 15, verse 5, now the God of patience and consolation grants you to be like-minded toward another like-minded toward another according to christ jesus that she may with one mind and one mouth glorify god even as the father of our lord jesus christ one mind one mouth one ministry 
one motivation, one direction, caring one for another. First Corinthians chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 25. First Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 25. It says that there should be no schism in the body, that there is no division in the body, that there is no disunity in the body, that there is no discord in the body. It's talking about the body that is complete with hands and feet and eyes and ears and mouth and brain and every other part. That it's when all those members of the body are well coordinated together. That's when that body will make progress. And that's why he's saying that there will be no division in the body. But that the members have the same care one of another. The same care one of another. That's practical. And that's what the Lord wants us to demonstrate. Galatians chapter 6. I'm reading from verses 1 and 2. Galatians chapter 6. Verses 1 and 2. It tells us, brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such and one in the spirit of meekness. He made a mistake. Uh huh. Remember your own meekness? He did wrong. Yes, that's, that's true. But remember yourself, it says that we restore one another in the spirit of meekness. Not with pride, not with boasting, not with oppression, not with hardship. Restore one another in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted. Bear ye one another's bodies, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear the bodies of others. Are you looking at First Peter? First Peter, chapter three, verse eight. Finally, be ye all of one mind. It takes salvation for this to happen. Be ye all of one mind. It even takes the second work of grace, sanctification. Purification of the heart, the cleansing of the heart, the removal of that old man, the Adamic nature, to be of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love us, brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not trying evil for evil. Are you born again? Not trying evil for evil. Are you a child of God? Not trying evil for evil. Somebody has made a mistake and then stepped on your toes. You are not looking. You don't know that hurts. Okay. I'll return it. Tit for touch. That's not Christianity. Those who are doing that have lost their experiences in the Lord. They have lost and they have missed the voice of the Lord. The Spirit is not speaking to them anymore. They are acting like unbelievers act. It says if this practical love, this purposeful love is there, it says not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye shall inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him, retain, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Plotting, planning evil, let him refrain his tongue from evil. And he says and his lips from speaking that he speak no girl. Let him chill evil. Restrain or withdraw from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue each. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against, tell me, them that do evil. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. When you see other people forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, and uh, you know, you turn you know, a blind eye to that, that's their business. They don't want to come. They're believers. They know about the Bible study. 
and they have decided they don't want to come. That's them. I'm going in any case. He has his own choice. Look at verse 25. Not forsaking uh, the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but tell me, exhorting one another, encouraging one another, helping one another, reminding one another, counseling one another, warning each other, but exalting one another, and so much the more, as you see the day approaching. Love, as expressed by Christ, love, as demonstrated through Christ, love, as manifested like Christ, will be practical, that love will be positive. That love will be purposeful. That love will be purifying. That love will be helpful. The love that helps other people, encourages other people, and makes other people to want to go on following the Lord. The love that is uplifting. The love that is edifying. That's Christ-like love. And it is sacrificial. It is sanctifying, it is sustaining, it is not seductive, and it is not self-seeking. We're looking at John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one toward another. And verse 36, now we come to point number three. The godlessness of self-confidence. The godlessness of self-confidence. It says in verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord... Whither goest thou, Lord? Whither goest thou? Where did this question come from? Come to verse 33. Little children, little children, in verse 33, yet a little while, I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said to the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say unto you, verse 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Did you see something here? Peter did not think about verses 34 and 35. He had heard verse 33. And all the time Jesus now was giving the new commandment, his mind was still thinking of verse 33. I'm going, you'll not be able to get there right now. But later, you'll come. And when Jesus finished giving the new law and the new commandment, which he wasn't thinking about, which he didn't meditate on. You see, when the word of God is going on, and you have another sin in your mind, and that sin is why, why about this? How about this? How about that? All the other things were seen. Well, those questions on your mind, you're not thinking about them. And so when you go out of the Bible study, you cannot practice what you didn't really hear. And Peter did not really fully hear what the Lord was saying. Saying. And what was important to him is, in this uh, verse uh, 36, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow now. You cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me hereafter. Again, Peter was not listening. You see the problem with people as uh, the Lord was telling him about his limitation, about his weakness, about the powerlessness of his life, about uh, something missing on the inside. He wasn't really listening. You know? Look at verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him. You know, sometimes we are fooled by the bragging of some people. They can brag a lot. They can boast a lot. And they can say, this is my consecration. This is where I'm going. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And they're not praying. They're not waiting upon the Lord. 
The strength is not in them. The grace is not in them. The Christian experience is not there. But they're not seeking for Christian experience. All they know is that as for me, this is what I'm going to do. And it's all empty self-confidence. Verse 38, Jesus answered, He him, well, thou lay down thy life for my sake. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me tries. Self-ignorance be breeds empty self-confidence. When you are ignorant of your limitation, you are ignorant of your lack of grace, you are ignorant of the limitation of your Christian experience, you are ignorant of your lack of sanctification, you are ignorant of the very depth of the nature that is inside you. That self-ignorance will be, it will breach empty self confidence. The self confident disciple Peter thought he was ready to lay down his life for the master. He was sincere. He was sincere. He didn't think he was pretending. He didn't think he was telling any lie. He was a sincere, but sincerity is not necessarily strength. That was sincere doesn't mean that was strong. The master warned him that he will deny him thrice. That very night, but Peter was not listening. We all know what happened. The master was right, and Peter was wrong. Let's come to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. And we're reading from verse 31. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. You know, the last thing that ever came to the mind of, of, of Simon, Peter, is that Satan had anything to do with him. And yet the Lord had warned him earlier. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. When he said something he shouldn't have said, and it was Satan that instigated him. And Peter had forgotten all about that. If you have forgotten everything we'll be hearing, everything we'll be learning, and the things that applies to you personally, you see, danger is very near. And now Christ told him again and said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he may save you as we. But I have prayed for thee. He is praying for us. Are you there? I said he's praying for us. I prayed for thee that thy faith shall not, shall not fail. Then he says, when art converted, when you are restored strength, then thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both to the prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. But once again, he wasn't paying attention. Eventually, it happened. It happened. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and a damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all, saying, I know not what thou seest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him, and said unto him, That were there, this fellow, was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, tell me, he denied how? With an oath, he even began to swear now. Ah, look at the man. I'm ready to die. No prayer. I'm ready to do. No prayer. I can never forsake you. No prayer. If all the people deny you, count on me. I will never deny you. He was not praying. Self-confidence is uh, the forerunner of the fall. I was told he denied again. When they said this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth, he said with an oath, I know him not. I know not the man. And after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art also one of them. For thy speech bereaves thee. Then began he to, let tell me, 
curse and to do what? Swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And tell me, tell me, thank God for a man that can repent. Thank God for a man that is not too proud to come back. He went out and he wept bitterly. The Lord is telling us that we're not strong in ourselves. Our strength is in the Lord. If you're going to do anything, you're going to carry out all the consecrations you are saying you can give to the Lord. It's going to take the grace of God. We're told in uh, Jeremiah chapter 10. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. Oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. But thank God a change came to Simon Peter. A change is coming upon you. Eventually he was baptized in the Holy Ghost. There's power in the Holy Ghost. I said there's power in the Holy Ghost. Look at it, look at it. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But he shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. He received the power. You received the power. I said you received the power. Acts chapter 4, reading from verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter filled what the Holy Ghost said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to this impotent man, by what means is made whole, be it known unto you all, and to all this, all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of, of Nazareth was seen denying anymore now whom he crucified whom God raised from the dead even by him does this man stand here before you hold this is the stone which the which uh, was set at naught of you builders which is become the hedge of the corner neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved now when they saw the when they saw the boldness of peter and John, and perceived that they were learned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them, tell me, that being with Jesus, the time will come, they'll take knowledge of you. Look at verse 17, verse 17, but that is spread no further. Among the people, let us strictly threaten them that they speak his fault to no man in this name. And he called them, and he commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. But we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Boldness had come. Courage had come. And they were not going to deny the Lord anymore. Your own time of courage has now come. When you're saved, when you're sanctified, when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, and you're filled with the Word of God, and you want to love like Christ has said, and you want to do good like Christ has said, chapter 5, chapter 5 from verse 27, Acts chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 27. It says in verse 27, it says when they have brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest 
us there, my saying, Did we not strictly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have, uh, it says, uh, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. You can tell the Holy Ghost has now come. And the Holy Ghost has now filled him. And the Holy Ghost now saturated him. And he said, whatever you think and whatever you say, we will obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree. Him as God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. I pray that this same courage will be in every one of us. Your place of work, you'll be courageous. In the marketplace, you'll be courageous. Anywhere you go, in the midst of the believers, you'll be courageous. In the midst of unbelievers, you'll be courageous in Jesus' name. And look at uh, chapter 5, verse 40. In verse 40, and to him they agreed. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council. What did they do? Rejoice. Tell me out aloud. Rejoice. Rejoicing. There's no mourning anymore. There's no regretting anymore. Rejoicing that day. And they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily, how often? How often are you going to do it? And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and to preach Jesus Christ. But remember, it's because the Holy Ghost had come upon them. That Holy Ghost is available tonight. The power of the Holy Ghost is available for everyone. And when He fills you, saturates you, induces you, empowers you, all that humility and the fear of man will vanish away from your heart in Jesus' name. And when you make your consecration, I will follow the Lord, I will serve the Lord, I will lay down my life for the Lord. It will not be an empty boast of self confidence, it will be that you are speaking from the energy of the Spirit inside you. Acts chapter 4, verse 31. Acts chapter 4, verse Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking when they were assembled together. When they had prayed, you are going to pray. I'm going to pray. And we're going to pray. We'll pray here. We'll pray at home. We'll pray every time. And the power that comes to our lives will, come, will give us the faith and the boldness and the authority and the anointing. And they we will stand the way we ought to stand. It says, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they speak the word of God. Tell me. With boldness, verse 33, and with great power, gave the apostles a witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There's no bragging, there's no boasting, there's no empty self-confidence, but there is a confidence in the Lord because Christ and the Spirit is a sufficiency. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5, it says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. My sufficiency is of God. His grace will be abundantly sufficient for you in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord receives glory. The Lord has glory. The fact that he has now gone for the crucifixion. And in that crucifixion, that's where we find our salvation.
That's where we find our conversion. That's where we find our redemption. That's where we find our sanctification. That's why we find the enablement. That's where we find the sufficiency. Because he died for us, we know now we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Pray that his strength will come to you and come upon you even tonight.